My name is Shirish. I'm a, a principal data engineer in Target Corporation in the US. And for those of you who do not know Target, it's a, a multi-billion dollar retail company like Walmart, which probably every one of you know about it. Uh, before coming to Target, I was a research scientist at uh, IBM Research in uh, uh, California. And most of the work uh, that I'm going to talk about here is actually built uh, when I was in IBM. And unlike a lot of presentations that you've seen today, uh, I'm going to talk about open source software uh, that's going to help you uh, scale machine learning in a very, very easy manner through declarative methods. And before I get there, let's look at uh, some applications of machine learning in the real world. And uh, the diverse uh, applications that you see from a variety of domains here, these are the actual engagements uh, that our team had with various uh, uh, partners uh, in the industry uh, at IBM. And the point that I want to highlight from this uh, slide is basically different applications require different type of solutions because they have different characteristics and different aspects. For example, uh, like one of the automotive company uh, wanted to build a predictive model that can predict when a car becomes a lemon. That means uh, uh, at which point the company has to reacquire that car uh, and give out a new car at no cost. So obviously, the sooner they predict, the better it is for the company uh, and also for customer satisfaction. And while building that model, the key aspect that we learned from the data is the more features that we add, the better the model is. Um, like, for example, when we increase the number of features from 250 to 20,000, the precision and recall has improved dramatically. And in contrast, uh, in a different use case, an airport wanted to build a, a model that can predict passenger volume at different places in the airport. And in this use case, uh, we realized that uh, having more models helped. For example, having a different model based on uh, person type or location type. For example, a check-in counter versus a coffee shop versus a restaurant uh, versus uh, the passenger gate at which you board the flight. So that's a different characteristic of diff uh, multiple models versus uh, the previous one, which is many features. And similarly, a uh, retail bank wanted to predict, uh, uh, basically understand customers' behavior from social media data. Uh, by looking at uh, tweets and Facebook messages, they wanted to understand customers' intent, whether uh, they are intending to buy a TV or uh, intending to travel to Hawaii. Uh, for their vacation or whatever. And the key aspect that we noticed in that particular use case is the data is very, very sparse. And we all know that like social media, which is text data, is very sparse. And on top of that, the signals for buying a TV is even more sparser, right? I mean, imagine a uh, thousand tweets and how many of them would be talking about buying a TV, right? So the point uh, is basically different applications require different a uh, uh, different way of solving it. One may be requiring large number of models, other one, another one may be requiring more number of data points, and so on and so forth. So how can we build like systems that enable effective data science in the presence of these diverse uh, uh, applications that we see in the industry? And if you think about it, there are actually uh, three key ingredients to effective data science. And first and foremost is obviously the algorithms. These are effectively the tools that we quiz upon uh, before we hire a data scientist. Do you know predictive algorithms? Do you know regression techniques? Do you know uh, deep learning? Uh, that's the hot field right now. So algorithms are obviously the key, and there are many of them. And second part of the piece is uh, uh, data, obviously. And we all heard about uh, different Vs of data, right? Volume, variety, velocity, and all those things. But in the context of machine learning, there are different uh, type of characteristics that you need to care about, whether your data is sparse or dense, or whether your data is few observations and large number of features, that means wide data, or the tall data, large number of observations with few uh, features, and all those uh, different aspects. And uh, finally, hardware. 
because once the data scientists build their algorithms and then tune that algorithm with respect to the specific characteristics that they see in the data, they need to finally execute it somewhere, right, on the hardware. And they need a, a special ability to scale from, they want to prototype their algorithms on their laptop and then slowly scale it to larger number of machines, maybe initially to 10 machines, but then as the uh, uh, requirements in your company grows, you want to scale that algorithms to hundreds of machines, right? And not only that, you want to scale according to the new technologies that are coming into the hardware industry as well, right? Uh, about 10 years back, uh, everybody was talking about multi-core machines. So you want to scale your algorithms on multi-core machines. And then from uh, li like last two, three years onwards, everyone is talking about, can we uh, accelerate our analytics through GPUs, right? And uh, who knows what's going to come uh, in the future. So as the uh, hardware industry is growing, your analytics uh, have to grow uh, accordingly so that you scale better and you make efficient use of the underlying hardware. So how do we build like a system that uh, fits uh, with all these three different aspects, algorithms, data, and hardware, right? And this brings us to um, uh, the word that I used in the uh, title, which is declarative. So you want a solution that lets you declare what you want to do, not uh, specify how you want to do it. So you want to separate what from the how. It's a data scientist, it should be the data scientist's responsibility to specify what needs to be done. And the system should figure out how it needs to be done. And which kind of kind, uh, points out that uh, one implementation cannot fit everything. Uh, like the libraries that you see in the market uh, currently, whether it's uh, Azure ML or uh, uh, some other libraries like Spark ML or any of those, these are predefined implementations of known algorithms. And as we see from these different characteristics of applications, that one implementation will not be uh, suitable for all the different use cases that we see across the industry. So we need to separate what from how by letting data scientists declare what they want to do. And if you think about it, uh, this is not new. This is actually exactly the same cycle we have seen back in 1970s when uh, SQL was introduced, right? And we all know how SQL has revolutionized the way uh, we think about data uh, in terms of analytics and uh, aggregations and so on. What do you do there? It's essentially declarative language. You simply declare that I want to select average salary from employees group by gender. That's simply a specification of what needs to be done. And the system, the database system, which is primarily the optimizer, will figure out how do you uh, scale this particular specification to large amount of data that you may have, or small amount of data that you may be sitting uh, that may be sitting on a laptop? So that optimizer will essentially generate an execution plan, which finally produces the result. And as a user, I rarely worry about what the optimizer is, uh, is doing. I'm totally focused on what my computation is. How do I express it? And the same thing we can do for machine learning as well. And that's what uh, uh, Apache System ML, System ML is about, which is uh, open sourced by IBM uh, back in 2015. Uh, it's an uh, incubator project in the Apache Software Foundation. And the logic is exactly the same thing. You simply specify what your machine learning algorithm is uh, in terms of linear algebra. So if you look at the database world, the operators are essentially relational al algebra, selections, filters, group by joints. Whereas in uh, machine learning, the operators are linear algebra, matrix multiplication, matrix inversion, matrix multiplication, uh, additions, and so on. Right? So you compose your algorithm using these machine learning operators, and these are exactly familiar to uh, all the data scientists, it looks like uh, mathematics, like R and Python uh, syntax. Um, so you simply specify that, and uh, the optimizer will take care of the rest. So this is essentially the architecture of the system. So this is exactly what uh, the users will write. And if you look at it, it's pretty much like the 
algorithm description of uh, iterative method for linear regression that you find in Wikipedia page. It's like reading a textbook, uh, pretty much ma uh, mathematic equations. And that's what you feed in uh, to the algorithm by passing in the data on which you want to run this particular method. And um, the system is going to go through a bunch of uh, optimization techniques. Uh, uh, borrowed from like programming languages because ultimately this is just a program, right? I need to analyze it just the way a typical uh, Java compiler look at uh, the Java program that you write. So it goes through language compiler in the runtime and then it will figure out the optimal execution plan for your architecture. So if your, com if your cluster uh, has GPUs, then they can be automatically be uh, leveraged to accelerate your workloads. Or if you have FPGAs, it can generate code for them. Um, and if I have Spark, for example, as a, in, instead of uh, MapReduce, so I, my optimization plan would be generating Spark operators. So based on the system that you have, based on the system configurations that you have, uh, the optimizer can uh, create uh, optimal execution plans. So that's what you get uh, out of Apache System ML. And uh, obviously, that's going to increase productivity of the data scientists, because they are now focused completely on figuring out uh, how to solve the business problem, as opposed to how do I make this linear regression work on a uh, billion data points, right? And another thing System ML offers is uh, uh, a variety of APIs and tools so that uh, you can use this particular software from a variety of uh, uh, integration points. You can directly run it as a standalone application on the command line, or if you are already uh, building Spark application using Spark SQL, Spark ML, and other pieces of Spark, you can integrate uh, System ML as another step into that uh, workflow as well. Uh, so you can call it from Scala or Java or Python, whatever language that you are using. And you, uh, you can also use it as an embedded scoring library. Like a lot of people who are familiar with data science would know that once you build the model, then you need to deploy that model in real time to make recommendations or to score the real time events. And uh, that scoring can also be specified as one of these uh, snippets of code and then you can uh, run that particular piece of code in real time. And also for experimentation, you can, uh, we also have like notebook API uh, for this particular software, so you can play with your data as you prototype your uh, models. And along with the language, it also comes with uh, kind of a pre-packaged versions of various different algorithms that are commonly used in the market. And unlike libraries, these are implementations done in the language. So as a data scientist, if you want to go and modify that particular algorithm, you are free to do. It's just a source code uh, written in like R-like language. So you go and modify that program according to your needs. Like for example, recently uh, at Target, one of the data scientists wanted to try out a new way of recommendation system that was recently published in uh, NIPS conference. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple twist on a popular algorithm. But if I'm using like a simple library like Spark ML or uh, uh, Azure ML, I have no way of controlling what goes on within that particular black box. Whereas with this, I can simply uh, open up uh, the relevant uh, algorithm's code and then make changes. Or if it's not part of this list at all, I can start coding up as if I'm writing uh, some mathematical equations on my notebook. And uh, under the hood, there's a lot of uh, optimizations uh, go on. I don't want to go through any of those details right now, but just to give you a uh, kind of a uh, snapshot of the type of uh, optimizations that uh, the system goes through. And these are some more examples. The simplest thing is, uh, uh, I mean, this is a little uh, mathematics-oriented optimization, but if you want, uh, so this trace is an operation that requires some of all the diagonal elements in the matrix. And x, uh, this symbol uh, signifies matrix multiplication in R, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's the same syntax. So I want to multiply x and y matrices and then take the sum of all the diagonals. And if you think about it, 
this is actually be re rewritten like this. The main advantage of that re uh, rewrite rule is basically you are reducing the cost of operation from a cubic operation into a quadratic operation. And if your data is huge, if I'm working on like millions of events where n is million, then reducing that uh, asymptotic complexity will buy you uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, performance. And the, all of that is automatically done. You, so you don't need to think about, oh, is this the best way of uh, writing the code for that particular data? If the, uh, if the operation uh, can be rewritten, the op optimizer is going to do it for you automatically. And there's a lot of ongoing efforts in the uh, open source community um, in terms of uh, how do we make it uh, more consumable through different APIs, as well as uh, what kind of operations uh, that we can add into this runtime engine so that uh, a variety of new techniques can be uh, uh, developed in this uh, particular framework. Like, for example, we are adding a lot of built-in functions uh, that are uh, kind of suitable for deep learning requirements. And this is kind of uh, just to show you how syst uh, something like SystemML can fit in with uh, existing workflows that you may have. Like if you have a, a production workflow running, uh, Spark, uh, running on Spark, you can think of SystemML uh, as sitting next to MLlib or Spark ML, uh, primarily geared for custom analytics, whereas we all know Spark SQL for relational data and uh, Spark ML for predefined set of algorithms. SystemML is for uh, kind of custom analytics that uh, your data scientists may want to uh, perform on your piece of data. And these are some of the links, uh, uh, just pointing to the open source repository that we have. Uh, about the project, releases, uh, you can directly download, and uh, uh, the download process and setting up is like two, three minutes. Uh, it, uh, all it takes is download and then uh, unpack that tarball, and then it's ready to go. And the beauty is that you can run it on, run this software on your laptop without any requirements. All you need is uh, uh, something like Spark uh, existing. If you don't have Spark, it will just run Java code in a sequential mode. Um, so uh, the requirements to r run and prototype is very, very uh, minimal. And once you develop your algorithm on your laptop, you can directly put it on your cluster and then run it on a large data. That's it. No, so going from uh, development to production is kind of uh, straightforward. You don't need to rethink your algorithm and then uh, uh, re-implement it for scalability. <laughs>